Recently, on one of the social media accounts, someone asked where the Hacker History Museum might live one day. There were votes for Silicon Valley, either San Francisco or Palo Alto. And there were votes for Las Vegas, where Hacker Summer Camp is held every year. Then someone submitted Cambridge, Massachusetts, home of MIT. And that made a lot of sense. If you've ever read Stephen Levy's book, Hackers, he talks a lot about the importance of Boston in the early 1990s. Certainly, Silicon Valley was necessary for the creation of the computer industry, with Bill Hewitt and David Packard and Sherman Fairchild all creating the industry that we need to protect today. But in terms of hacker history, I think that's firmly on the East Coast and in Boston. Yes, in the San Francisco Bay Area, there were hackers as well. There were BBSs, such as the one that Dark Tangent Jeff Moss used, and the Homebrew Computer Club, which Steve Wozniak was a member of. But in terms of really defining the moment, I'm still going to give it to Boston, or Cambridge in particular. One of the hacking groups that came out of that period was Loth, with a zero and a PH. In episode three of Error Code, I interviewed Joe Grand, a.k.a. Kingpin. In this episode, I'm interviewing Chris Thomas, a.k.a. Space Rogue, who has just written the book, Space Rogue, How Hackers Known as the Loft Changed the World. There have been other books about other hacker groups, or articles written about the Loft in particular. Often, these are just journalists chronicling what's publicly known about the group. What I like about Chris's book is that it's his life, so the anecdotes and asides are natural. And you start to get a real context for how the loft in the 1990s came about, and also why it's unlikely there will be anything like it ever again. This is the story of Chris Thomas. This is also the story of the loft. I'm Robert Vermosi. This is Error Code. Uh, my name is Space Rogue, uh, also known as Chris Thomas, and I am a hacker. Uh, I work with IBM, and they give me a title of the global lead of policy and special initiatives for IBM X-Force. I think there are some expectations about hackers, particularly those back in the 1990s, where somehow they all came from rich families, ones who could afford to buy a computer or who could pay for the long-distance phone calls necessary to connect with BBSs at the time. Chris, then, is reflective of perhaps real hackers back in the day, in that his story is quite humble, and it begins in rural Maine. A small town called Winthrop, which is a little south of Augusta and north of Lewiston. Um, not Kind of a, a touristy town in the summer, anyway. A lot of uh, folks come from away, as we say, to live there. And then in the winter, it, it dries up a bit, and there isn't as many people. And we lived on a small little uh, two-acre patch of land out in the woods, um, and uh, my dad would basically farm all the neighbors' backyards. Uh, and so we would drive the tractor up and down the street and, and farm everybody's yards for them. So this was not San Francisco or New York or even Los Angeles. This was a quiet town in the northeastern part of the United States. And this was a great place to raise a family. Yeah, I mean, computers weren't a thing, uh, at least not personal home computers. Uh, so like, we had a telephone, we had a radio, we were lucky to have a TV. Um, uh, and I think the first computery thing I saw was, was, was late seventies at my uncle's house and he had an Atari Pong game. Um, it might not even have been Atari. It might've been before Atari when it was Sears and you hook it up to your TV, uh, and you can play Pong. Um, and I'm not really how sure how to describe it other than a tennis match, uh, by comparison to today's video games, it's very, very basic. Pong hooked up to your TV and had wired handsets that allowed you to move a paddle up and down on one side of the screen that was yours while a square ball went back and forth. If you missed, your opponent got a point. This is a long way from having a computer that could actually do something. I was getting ready to try to go to college after I got out of the service. And, you know, you realize, you know, you really kind of probably should have a computer. Um, personal computers were big then. Uh, this is, we're looking at middle, middle eighties here, late eighties. Uh, and so it's like, oh, let's, let's go shopping for a computer. At this point in his life, Chris has enlisted in the military, if only to earn money for college later. 
In the 1980s, he's in the perfect place to buy an early personal computer. He's stationed in the San Francisco Bay Area in Monterey, just south of San Jose. Uh, and so I jump around, I go to a bunch of computer stores, uh, and they're all wicked expensive. I can't afford any of them, really. Uh, and, and so I'm looking for a store that will allow me to finance it and give me credit to, to buy the computer. Um, and, you know, store after store, uh, they all say no. No, not going to happen. Uh, you, you know, I was a lowly private. You know, everybody knows how much you, you make, so they know how much. But you, you're not going to give you any credit. So, uh, I think the, I was in the last store, downtown Monterey, Computer Land, uh, and I just I basically just walk in. I don't even look at the computers. I just find talk to a salesman. Yeah, can I get credit? And they're like, Yep. And I'm like, Sign me up. What do you got? Uh, so I ended up with a Macintosh SE. Uh, with one megabyte of megabyte of RAM and two floppy disks, uh, so not didn't even have a hard drive. Uh, a little nine-inch screen built into it, uh, and that's what I lugged back on the bus back to the Army barracks to to start my computing journey. I'm curious why Chris chose Apple. At the time, there were Osbournes, there were Commodore 64, and later 128s, and there were the IBM PCs. Did Chris somehow know that Apple would survive? No, it was not a conscious decision. I had no idea even what it was. Uh, I mean, at the time, it was XTs and ATs, uh, PC compatibles, was really the, the big thing. Um, and uh, it was just, it was the one machine I could get, right? It was the one computer I could get. And so that's what I ended up with. It wasn't a choice. You know, I saw the Steve Jobs uh, ad on the Super Bowl in 1984, and I really got motivated by this whole Apple computer thing. Um, no, no, I had no idea what any of that was at the time. And it was just, that was the machine I could get. So that's the machine I started with. After completing his military service, Chris moved back East. Why? He was in Monterey with Silicon Valley to the North up highway 17, where all the cool companies were about to be built in the 1990s. Yet he moved to Boston. Why? Wow, that's a good question. Um, no, I remember I applied to a bunch of different schools. Um, I had a big, long list of criteria that I wanted, and I don't remember what all the criteria was. Um, and at the time, you couldn't just like surf the websites and look up schools. You had to get a book. Uh, and there's, they would publish these huge books every year, like two or three inches thick on newsprint, uh, listing all the schools in the country uh, and all the, the, the programs that they offered and the degrees that they offered and whatnot. And I had like two or three different degrees I was, I was looking at and there was some other criteria. And so I went through the whole book and I picked all the schools that matched my criteria uh, that were, I think, basically in the Northeast. I think I was looking specifically in the Northeast. Um, and uh, BU was one. I remember I also applied to UMaine Orono, uh, University of Connecticut at Hartford, I think, uh, MIT, uh, BU, I don't remember. There's probably a couple other schools. I mean, and and application fees weren't crazy then. I mean, now they're like a couple hundred bucks just to apply. At the time, it was like 35, 50 bucks, 75 dollars maybe. That was at the high, the outlier. So it wasn't. It was. It was encouraged to apply to a lot of schools, and then you would get either accepted or rejected, and uh, you could pick and choose. Now you're lucky to get accepted, you know, because you only apply to two or three, uh, and you're lucky to get, get accepted to one. Uh, but yeah, so I got accepted to, I think, everything I applied to except MIT. Uh, and I think that's one of the stories that's in the book is how I, that all came about. But uh, so BU was was uh, accepted me. I was like, OK, I'll go there. Um, but uh, didn't have a lot of resources to pay for it. Uh, and so I didn't end up staying there very long. It was about this time that John Markoff came out with his book, Cyberpunk, Outlaws and Hackers on the Computer Frontier. Chris was influenced by this. Although, in retrospect, he says, less so. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it was interesting because it was really the first experience that I had or first exposure that I had to anything like that world or that part of the scene or, or whatever you want to call it. Like this whole underground thing of, of uh, you know, and Kevin Mitnick p plays, is portrayed heavily in the book. And I really need to go back and read it, but... Um, that whole story really kind of fascinated me. Um, it, it, it's interesting, you know, years later or even one year later, how you realize that that book was really kind of over the top and, and full of hyperbole and exaggeration and, 
Um, probably not as accurate as I thought it was when I first read it, but uh, that was really a, a, a fascinating book for me and it sort of started me on the on the road of looking like this, this world exists. Uh, I wonder if I can find it. Uh, and so I had my Mac SE and I had my modem and uh, I was like, I was already calling bulletin boards at the time. And so, you know, let me see if I can find something a little edgier than uh, what I've been calling and, and see what else is out there. And I think that started me on the, uh, the, the road to discovery, of the, as it were. BBSs were not something that you could just reference online. Online didn't exist. You had to hear about it from someone. There wasn't one BBS. Like now we have one internet and everything's connected to it. So you just get online and you're online and you can connect to anything. Um, bulletin board systems were, were small individual computers that were run in somebody's house uh, on a phone line. Uh, and so you needed to know the phone number in order to call that BBS with your phone, uh, with your modem on your phone line. Uh, and it would basically be one computer talking to one other computer. Um, if you were lucky, you'd find a bulletin board that had two phone lines or three and you'd have two or three people on the system at the same time. Uh, those were really few and far between. Usually it was one computer talking to one other computer. You would hang up and somebody else would dial in and they would access that computer. Uh, and that's why it was considered a bulletin board system because you would go like a traditional physical bulletin board. You would go and you would write a message and you'd pack it to the bulletin board and leave. And then someone else could come by and read your message and then add their own message or whatever. Uh, and so that's that's uh, basically what it was. It was one person at a time. And so you would lo log into the BBS. And one of the first things you would always do is you would check their list of other BBSs. Like, what other phone numbers do you have in your system that I can call that I haven't already called? And so you would collect these numbers. Uh, and you would want numbers that were local to your calling area. Otherwise, you'd have to pay long. It's another concept we don't have any any thought of today is long distance charges. What do you mean it costs more to make a phone call to California than it does across the street? Like, it's all the same today, right? Uh, but back then, you would usually get your local calling area, which was your town, and then maybe one other town or the neighboring towns that you were next to. If you wanted to call 20 miles away or you wanted to call across the state or into another state, then they would charge you extra money for that. Uh, and those charges were not inexpensive. They were very expensive. I remember... Uh, there was a, we had a family of the friend of the family who moved to Virginia. My mother wanted to call her. Uh, and so she had to call the operator first and ask, how much does it cost to call this phone number at 4 PM in the afternoon on a Thursday, uh, for seven minutes? And they would, she would get a price. And so she would make the call at that time, uh, at 4 PM on a Thursday and she would time it and then hang up at six and a half minutes just to make sure that she didn't go over because it would make sure that we fit in the budget and we could only spend that much money. So if you can imagine trying to be online for 20, 30 minutes, an hour at a time, those phone charges add up quick. So a lot of times you're limited to the local calling area that you're in and you have to hope that there are BBSs in the area that you are that you live in so that you can call them uh, and actually participate in those discussions in that community. I find it interesting reading his book that Chris has always been in security whether it was physical security or infosec. Yeah, I hadn't really made that connection before, but you're absolutely right. Some of my first jobs uh, when I when I ran out of money at Boston University was was doing uh, physical security. Basically, I was a mall cop, uh, you know, Paul Blatt, the whole thing. Um, and then uh, so, and then I would do residential security uh, and walk around apartment buildings. Uh, and, and then I was falling in with Loft. And then in, in my career, even after uh, Loft and at stake, I, I mean, still stayed in the in the security space, uh, working for Trustwave and Tenable and now IBM. Um, so, yeah, I've kind of been in the security space ever since the beginning. Chris's book is about his life and the Loft. About this time, he started connecting with the founding members at BBS meetups and, of all places, computer stores. I think the chain of events was uh, I would go to these uh, works gatherings, which we called them. And this was a work, the works was a BBS in Boston. A lot of elite people hang out on that bulletin board. And so they would have get togethers, physical get togethers where everybody would meet up and drink a coffee or eat a pizza or whatever. Um, and those works gatherings then morphed into 2,600 meetings. But I met Brian Oblivion, uh, Goggle 13, 3D Fish, uh, some other folks. 
that was the first time I, I actually interacted with those uh, those people. And somehow uh, we all ended up working at CompUSA. All across America, computers are changing people's lives. And one company is changing the way people buy them. CompUSA. With the brands you want, all at guaranteed low prices. Like Corel Draw 3.0, the easy-to-use, all-in-one graphic software. And find any window document in three seconds with Phoenix Eclipse 5. We're everything you're looking for. which sort of kind of makes sense because uh, here you have this new company coming in uh, and it needs people that can, that can sell the product and knows the product and knows computers enough to tell other people about them and to sell them. Uh, and so where are you going to get these people? Well, you're going to get the people that live in Bay every day anyway uh, and are willing to work for minimum wage, which basically means kids in high school and college who are calling bulletin board systems. Over the years, I've read many different histories of the loft, but I didn't know that it was actually an artist's loft. Space at the time in South Boston, where we were, uh, was a very, uh, I don't know what the correct term, up and coming, I guess, is what they call it now. Uh, It wasn't up and coming then. It was pretty much down and out. Uh, And a lot of the buildings in the area were old factory buildings, old warehouses, and were very dilapidated. Uh, And so the owner of this particular building had turned them into artist lofts. Uh, and the, the stipulation was that you couldn't live there, right? And there was no facilities that would allow you to live there. There was no washer dryer. There was no kitchen sink. There's no refrigerators. There's no place to plug them in. Basically, it's one big, huge room, uh, maybe like, I don't know, 20 by 100, 20 by 50, maybe. Big, long room. Uh, hard wooden floors like you find in old factory spaces, uh, drafty windows. Um, and it came with electricity because the landlord was too cheap to break the spaces out onto different meters. So he's just like, all right, I'm throwing, I'll throw the electricity in with the rent. Uh, and he put a stipulation in the lease that you couldn't run an air conditioner. Uh, and we're like, okay, like, whatever. Uh, nothing in the lease about, you know, large multi-cabinet computer systems, uh, which we ended up having, but uh, no, no air conditioners. So yeah, it was an artist loft space. There was a, I remember that some of the other folks in the building were doing pottery. There were several painters. Uh, and they would have open studios every once in a while. Everybody opens their door and people come by and look at the artwork that you're working on. We, of course, never participated in those. But, um, you know, in the bathrooms, like out in the hallway, down the hall. Uh, and the, the, I don't remember if we had roof access in that building or not. But um, and, and we were never there during the day anyway, because we're all working during the day. So we're only there in the evenings. The building's empty. There's nobody else there because the artists are all there during the day. Um, so it's uh, it worked out well. Uh, we had that big space. Everybody had their their tables and their chairs, and we had you know, sort of everybody had their own little work area. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was an actual loft space. So to learn about computers, you actually have to have a computer. And one of the ways that you could get computers would be to swap. And what they did in Boston was rather clever. There was the MIT flea market, or the flea. Yes, MIT Flea is a fixture in the Boston area still. It still exists, and you can still go there. Um, I don't know how old it was at the time. It probably been around for at least a decade or so by the, the time we got there in the 90s, um, maybe longer. Uh, but basically, the MIT ham radio computer flea market is uh, uh, held by a group uh, of students, I think, at MIT or ham radio enthusiasts. Uh, and the goal was is to, to swap ham radios and stuff, right? Tubes, radio things. Uh, But uh, as happened with most things by the 90s, uh, computers started to get into the ham radio hobby as a a useful tool um, because people would do packet switching radio and and X25 networks, and you kind of need computers to do all that stuff. And so a lot of computer and electronic equipment would make its way into the flea market. Uh, And then, of course, it's right in the middle of MIT, so you get all kinds of lab equipment and all kinds of weird things at the at the flea market. Um, the, I remember one year uh, there was a one lady who showed up and she was trying to sell a bunch of custom jewelry. Um, and so they politely asked her not to come back after that, um, which, you know, that's, they're trying to make sure that it stays the MIT ham radio and computer flea market and not custom jewelry flea market. So um, and there are people that go every month. Uh, and sell their wares, and I think maybe even make a living traveling up and down the East Coast, going to other other 
ham radio shows, but uh, we made a lot of money at that that show. I shouldn't say a lot of money. We made enough to pay the rent. Uh, and we would get stuff to sell there from the trash. Uh, most of us had day jobs working uh, in doing tech support or uh, uh, you know other IT department type functions at various companies in and around Boston. And they were always cleaning out and throwing out old equipment. Uh, and it would often fall on our a part of our job to throw that equipment out. Well, it would just miss the dumpster and end up in the back seat of my car instead. Um, and then we'd t- haul it off to the flea uh, and sell it and use the money that we would make from the flea market to pay the rent or pay our internet bill or uh, you know that sort of thing. Uh, we never really made enough to cover all the rent. So we were still paying a little bit out of pocket every month, um, but it was still of a fun activity every summer um, from April to October, I think it is, uh, to ride down to a parking lot in the middle of Cambridge uh, and set up a bunch of old junky computer equipment that we basically rescued from the trash uh, and then make a couple hundred bucks to, p- to pay the rent. But uh, uh, it was always a good time. And then, of course, we'd spend money at the flea buying other junk and then have to take that back to the loft and tinker on it. Uh, and then when we couldn't get it to work, we'd sit, take it back to the flea the next month and sell it again. So... So the founders of The Loft would be Count Zero, White Knight, Brian Oblivion, and Gogol 13. In addition to Space Rogue, there were others. There would be Dildog, there would be Kingpin, a.k.a. Joe Grand, Weld Pond, a.k.a. Chris Weisopel, Mudge, a.k.a. Peter Zatko, and Tan, a.k.a. John Tan. Each had their own skills and abilities, and Space Rogue he tended to align with the more traditional path in computer security, by focusing on things like software and computer networking. One of the things that Loft, we recognized early on with Brian Oblivion being very uh, radio-centric and, and hardware-centric and, and Kingpin also doing a lot of radio stuff and then um, you know me doing networking and software and, and Mudge doing really deep-level code analysis and Weld doing uh, code analysis also and, and then Dildog and so on. We really, we learned early on that the marriage of hardware and software uh, was very important. And we're starting to see, well, I shouldn't say starting. We've been seeing that for the last 20 years. Uh, and I keep saying, oh, they're just waking up to that now. Uh, and it's been a very slow awakening. Uh, but we were very, I think we were on cutting edge realizing that the you can't really have secure hardware without secure software and vice versa. Um, and so the fact that we had those skill sets in the loft, I think sort of gave us uh, and it, I don't know, I, I was going to say advantage, but I don't know over who. There's nobody else really in the space at the time doing that sort of thing. But gave us an advantage and an insight that that I think other companies and other security companies have lacked uh, ever since. And, and and every now and then something will come along and we'll say, oh, see, yeah, yeah. Uh, we were talking about that 20, 30 years ago. Uh, you know, we have the rise of IoT. We have the rise of ICS and, and OT. Um And all that stuff depends on the marriage of hardware and software together. Uh, And you'll see uh, a vulnerability in the the hardware implementation uh, once in a while. You'll see a vulnerability in the software implementation once in a while. And then because of one and the other, you get a new class of vulnerabilities because they're the vulnerabilities that exist because of both of them and how they're configured. So, yeah, it was great to have Joe and Brian there doing the hardware stuff and looking at stuff. I mean, one of the early uh, hacks or... or, or, uh, uh, vulnerabilities that we found was in the RSA card, uh, Secure ID. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if anybody remembers these. They, basically, they had a, a credit card that had a, a number on a little LCD panel that would change every three minutes or so. And then when you'd log into your system, you'd have to enter in that number that was displayed. And if it matched, if the computer made the match, it would let you log in. If it didn't match, you couldn't log in. Uh, but we found a vulnerability in that where you could actually slow the card down because of the clock crystal. Uh, because the software wasn't checking this. Anyway, marriage of hardware and software. Um, I don't need to explain all the vulnerabilities. People can go look them up if they want. Okay, I've done a lot of these stories, and I noticed that Doom is always the default game that shows up on every single computer screen for whatever reason. Whether it be a IoT device or some mainframe computer, it's real flex to be able to get Doom to run. I just wondered, why that game? Why not? Mario Kart. That's a good question. I don't. I don't know, but somehow that became the meme um, for Loft. Uh, we were we were playing Castle Wolfenstein. If you, if you remember the precursor to Doom, 
Uh, and Castle Wolfenstein was uh, unique in the fact that it it sort of gave you a 3D perspective um, in, in a first person shooter type scenario. It was one of the very early, if not, I don't even know, it might've been the first first person shooter. Um, but then that morphed into Doom. And I think one of the popularity, popular things about Doom is that you could network it and you could have multiple people playing at the same time uh, on the same game, which was unique at the time. It was really a, a fascinating thing. Uh, and for Loft, like we would have, we would play Doom on our network. That's one of the reasons why we put our network together uh, before we connected to the internet so that we could play Doom. We had all these computers in the same room. Why wouldn't you, right? Um, and we found we found a lot of bugs in the Doom networking stack, uh, partly because our network was really bad um, and didn't work the way it was supposed to, uh, and we were using you know cables out of the trash, uh, and so Doom would crash a lot, and for some reason it would crash a lot on my machine. Uh, and I remember we traced one issue back to uh, a bad network cable uh, between my machine and our concentrator, and <laughs> it spent us hours fi figuring out finding that cable. And was, actually, I still have a piece of it here in my desk. Uh, if you look on, we read the, on the side of the cable, it says CheaperNet, which is actually was a brand name. I'm like, why would you name your brand cheaper? Uh, so we cut that cable up to make sure nobody else pulled it out of our trash uh, and used it again. But I kept a piece of it. I still have a piece uh, of CheaperNet just to remind me that, that you know, things aren't always uh, working properly like they should. So the loft was a physical workspace where members could go after their day jobs and they had to pay rent on the facility itself. There were other options for hackers at the time. For example, there were places where hackers both lived and worked. Yeah, so we had, it was uh, Messiah Village, uh, New Hack City, uh, Sin House, or maybe it was Sin, I think it was Sin House. Um, but so, you know, like minds tend to gravitate together. Uh, and, you know, the same thing was happening with, with hackers and online communities and uh, there was a lot of physical space interaction uh, through 2600 meetings and works gatherings. Um, so people sort of all knew each other. And, and for the most part, a lot of people were in their, their late teens, early 20s, mid to late 20s, uh, that sort of age group. Uh, and so if, if you're in that age group and you're trying to find a place to live, uh, and you don't have a lot of money, you tend to room with other people and you'll rent an apartment, a two or three bedroom apartment, you'll have two or three roommates. Uh, um, and that's still pretty common today. Uh, and so at some point, somebody got the idea of why don't we rent the whole house? Uh, and so you'd have four or five people living together instead of you know just two or three in an apartment. And that's where Messiah Village came out. Uh, it was, uh, I don't remember exactly where it was. It wasn't too far from the loft in South Boston, but it was in a different part of Boston. Uh, and there were a bunch of people that lived there, Death Vegetable, Tweety Fish, um, Garbage Heap. Um, and maybe they didn't actually live there. They just happened to frequent the, the, that space. Uh, and Messiah Village, when that lease ended up, that, the, a lot of the people left Messiah Village and got another house in Alston. And it was called New Hack City. Uh, and the, that name actually came out of a magazine article, and I think Esquire that was called New Hack City, which was a play on the movie New Jack City. Uh, so it all kind of rolls in one big thing downhill. Uh, so that was New Hack City. Sin House was over in Cambridge um, and had a more goth oriented uh, residency. Uh, Hubob lived there. Uh, I think Iskra may have lived there for a short time. Uh, and these are all names that are coming to me, uh, handles of people that I knew in the Boston scene. Um, so yeah, so that was pretty common. And the loft was was a little bit different from that in the fact that nobody lived there, right? So it was a it was a hacker space before hacker spaces, uh, but it wasn't a hacker house because one, it was a loft, uh, and two, nobody actually lived there, unlike the the other spaces, the other hacker houses. So um, yeah, that was common in Boston. I don't know if that was a sort of a thing in other cities or not. If there were hacker houses uh, like that with names and and uh, residences who were primarily knew each other online? Possibly. I don't know. In the early 1990s, there started to be meetups and conferences for hackers around the country. One of the early ones was HoHoCon. HoHoCon, yeah. So uh, conferences started to become a thing, um, you know, early, early, early 90s, I guess. I think DEF CON was an early one. Uh, HoHoCon, there was Pump, PumpCon still exists also. There was Tri-State Con, which predated PumpCon. Uh, HoHoCon was my first quote, hacker conference, right? Uh, 
Uh, it was in uh, geez, Houston, Texas, I think. I don't think it was Austin. I think it was Houston. Um, and so I had to actually use a travel agent to book my flight because you couldn't book them online by yourself. So I flew. I somehow saved up enough money, uh, flew down to Houston. It was in a Motel 8, I think. Uh, and there was one track in one conference room uh, with maybe six or seven talks throughout the day. Uh, it was an interesting experience for me. I hadn't ever experienced anything like it. Um, everybody's kind of crammed into one room. It's really hot and steamy. Everybody's smoking because you could do that then. Uh, but there was a presentation. I remember two specific presentations that were given. One was on UFOs uh, because for some reason there was a segment of the, the hacker underground, the hacker world, who really firmly believed that the government was keeping UFO information secret from everybody else. And so they wanted to encourage people to break into government systems and look for UFO data. Okay, whatever. Um, it, that comes into play years later if, you, if you're familiar with the Gary McKinnon case, because that was one of the reasons why he was rooting around NASA. And he was a guy from England who ended up getting busted. But anyway, the other presentation I saw at Hohu Khan in 1992 uh, was on Van Eck freaking. Um, and if, if you don't know what that is, it's sort of uh, the fact that uh, electronic equipment emits signals, uh, radio signals that can then be picked up at a distance. Uh, and reconstituted into what those signals are. Um, and specifically in the mid to late 90s, everybody had big CRT monitors. And so you could pick up the image from a CRT, a cathode ray tube, a, a TV screen, uh, over the air at a distance. Uh, and so they, they showed this as a demonstration. It was only a couple of feet on a coffee table uh, at the conference, but it was still eye-opening for me that that whole so this is possible. This is an exist. And they're using like rabbit ears and stuff to do this with. Um, and so I was like, you know, if you had some real equipment and could put this together, like you could, I could totally see this going, uh, you know, at least a couple hundred feet. Um, you know, I think there was, there was rumors that it could go miles and uh, the NSA and whatnot, government agencies knew that this was a thing. So there was, there was a Van X shielded equipment that they used. And, uh, you know, I read about this later on years later and I was like, oh yeah. That was that conference uh, back in 92 that I was at in, in Houston. So uh, HoHoCon was 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 interesting, eye-opening experience for me. HoHoCon was mentioned in the book Cult of the Dead Cow by Joseph Men. Apparently, there were some mistakes in Joe's book. And I don't want to get into too much in Joseph Men's book, but he draws the, the parallel that, you know, Loft, because it had CDC members, was part of CDC. And in my view, that's not the case. Uh, yes, we had CDC members, but the loft was a separate and its own thing uh, and not part of CDC. Um, so, uh, you know, CDC had their thing and they and we I knew a lot. We knew a lot of the people that were in CDC uh, and there was a bunch of them in Boston and we, there was a lot of cross pollination there. And there were CDC people in, in HoCon and other conferences uh, and we would chat together online. Uh, but Loft was not really part of CDC or any other group. So is there any sort of relationship between Cult of the Dead Cow and Loft? There were uh, people in CDC who were at the Loft. Um, uh, and I know Mudge eventually ended up getting uh, a membership in CDC and uh, uh, Dildog was a member of CDC. But there were other hacker groups that were represented at the loft as well. There was restricted data transmissions, RDT, which was uh, Brian Oblivion's group. Um, uh, I don't remember if we had a woo-woo member or not. We may have. Um, and there were, there were other various groups of, of, you know, some known, some unknown that other people had membership in that were also members of the loft. Okay. So loft was its own thing. And it was distinct from other hacker groups that existed at the time. But... It engaged with several of those other groups nationwide. Yeah, there was a lot of interaction. And again, not just with CDC, but a lot of other groups as well. Um, it was a very uh, uh, amorphous time uh, with not very clearly defined borders and membership in various groups would come and go basically on a whim. You upset somebody. OK, you're banned from my group. You know, oh, we're going to invite this new person in or whatever. Um, Loft was a little bit more clear cut in that in that idea because we were mostly we were physical space right um and a lot i think a lot of the other groups often existed online and memberships were online and they didn't often meet other members physically except at conferences and then maybe even not then so 
it was very uh, amorphous, I think is probably, I don't know if that's the word I'm looking for, but very fluid um, amongst the people and the groups and, and what you belong to and what you didn't. So this was the hacker underground and people really didn't understand it or know much about it. There were movies like War Games where it implied that a high school kid could break into the NORAD defense system. Naturally, the media got involved. Yeah, so I think uh, one of Loft's earliest media uh, interactions was, was with WTBS, uh, actually, uh, and uh, Cyberpunk, uh, I don't remember. They were doing some video award game show. And they came in and they did like a whole day of filming and then they used like 15 seconds of the shot on, on in the show. Um, and then there was another show that we did some video for and then uh, Annalisa Savage came and did a segment on Loft for her uh, groundbreaking uh, video, Unauthorized Access. Uh, which I totally encourage everybody to watch. You know, some people have asked, like, what exactly, you know, what is the, what is the loft? And I was just like, well, it's like a clubhouse. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Except we don't have, we don't have secret handshakes or anything. But it's neat too when we have, when we have like friends over, like visiting from out of state or whatever, um, and they're into computers like we are. You know, there's a place we can all, we, we can you know, bring them here and they can, they can sleep here. I mean, initially we were just looking for storage space, <laughs> you know. To just store stuff. We and we, we're getting a lot of print press too because we're we're starting to release vulnerabilities. Uh, we have our website up. We've been on McNair. I think I don't know, I think McNair Lair was before MTV. This is the loft, L zero P H T in internet terms, and a real loft in an industrial building in Boston. Seven young men rent the space, which is crowded with discarded computers they retrieve from dumpsters at MIT and put back into working order. They spend their working days as computer professionals, then gather at night to push the envelope. We all basically do the exact same thing, nine to five or eight to six or whatever. So what do you do? So what do you do at six to midnight? It's the off hours. It's the time spent here that we can push what we've stumbled upon to to a limit to the extreme. They've been described as a hacker think tank, brilliant crypto crackers, and much worse. They do it mostly for the challenge, and what they've ferreted out is sometimes startling. They are proudest of creating software that exposes security flaws in Lotus software and Microsoft's most sophisticated operating system. They can also read private pager messages and intercept supposedly secure police communications systems that are assumed to be encrypted. So everything was going okay with mainstream media. That is, until MTV came along. Um, So we'd gotten a little pretty media savvy at that point. Um, And MTV decides they wanted to do a segment for their real life show. I think that's what it was called. MTV's Real Life. Uh, And they wanted to do a segment on hackers. Um, and so they, I think they ended up contacting 2600 first and Emmanuel Goldstein. And then through them, they reached out to us, uh, at the loft and we're like, sure, like, you know, we'll talk to you. Um, but we handled it a little bit different than we normally handle, um, uh, our media requests. And usually we try to, we, we would try to make sure that the media was, wasn't going to smear us and, and say bad things about us. That, oh, those evil hackers are breaking into everything. Uh, which was very common at the time, very sensational story, uh, always got eyeballs and clicks. So uh, why not go for it? But obviously it painted us in a bad light and it wasn't something that we wanted to do. So we would try to sort of meet with the media and make sure that that wasn't the story that they were planning. And if they were planning that, to try to educate them into to, to what we were really all about. We didn't really get an opportunity to do that with MTV. Um, and uh, so they already had an agenda and knew what story they wanted to do before they even arrived, uh, as most media does. Like they, they are, they just want the 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 the, the sound bites. They already know what they want. Uh, they're not gonna. They're not doing exploratory when they got the cameras rolling and, and paying five people to to do on the film and the audio and the lights and everything else. Um, so uh, they came in. They spent the whole day at the loft. They did all that filming. We gave them the full spiel. Talked to them all our projects, covered all this stuff. Uh, I really love to, wow, I didn't even think about getting the raw footage of all that stuff that they have. I wonder if that Emma TV still has it. That would be awesome. But anyway, so they did all that filming and then they, uh, none of it is what they wanted. And I think they used 30 seconds of law. Um, and instead, uh, some folks in New York City decided that they were going to troll MTV uh, and do this big 
fake story of how they were being uh, chased by the FBI and there was a missing floppy disk and uh, they were trying to save the world. And it sounded an awful lot like the plot from the movie Hackers, uh, which is basically what it was. Hide the planet! Hide the planet! Shut up and yeah. get in the car! Hide the planet! And it, it, the MTV totally bought the whole thing, hook, line, and sinker, and ran with that as their story. Uh, and as a total, total debacle, and I think failure uh, on our part, not just Loft, but the entire community's part to sort of leverage that opportunity uh, of getting a message out. Um, and so we sort of took that as a hard lesson learned and, and was able to uh, double our, redouble our efforts to try to sort of educate media after that. Um, and it, it's, it became a, a core foundation of at least my activities at the loft. I don't know if everybody else there sort of thought that was an important thing or not, but I did. And, um, you know, started to try to reach out to various media and make sure that uh, we could try to get the, the positive good of hacking out there instead of the, the evil criminal aspects. Having been burned by the media in general, the loft, specifically Chris, took it upon himself to try and promote a more positive image of hackers in the real world. This led to the creation of the Hacker News Network. Yeah, so, and I think that might have been, I don't remember if that was before MTV or slightly after, but um, definitely influenced by our, our experience with MTV. So um, we had this, it was a weird, like, we all have day jobs. So we'd go to our day jobs and, and we'd, we'd email each other, oh, look at this news article I found. Um, oh, this is important. I want everybody else to read this. I'm going to email this to everybody. Um, and it kind of got to be sort of a, almost a little bit of a competition. It's like, who's going to get the email? Who's going to get the, the link first and email it out? Uh, and this was at the time, there were websites like Slashdot was huge. Like that was the website. You, if you were on Slashdot, you made it. Like that was the first site you checked every morning. Um, and so I kind of got the idea. It's like, you know, instead of just sharing these, these URLs of these news stories that I'm finding with the other folks at the loft, it'd be great if I could share them with everybody. Like, this is this is important stuff. I want everybody to know about these things that I'm finding, these news articles. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'm going to create a website. And uh, I brought it up at our weekly meeting. We had standard weekly meetings at the loft. Everybody would show up and we'd talk about all the projects that we're working on. I'd be like, hey, I want to uh, spend a little bit of money, get a domain and, and create a website and, and, and run it on our... Uh, uh, our pipe post these links on and everybody's like yeah okay whatever uh go ahead uh and i you know the, the response i don't think was all that enthusiastic uh but i'm like all right i'm gonna do it uh and so we spent the 35 bucks or whatever what it cost for a domain back then uh and then a couple of weeks later you know weld had built some graphics for me and uh, i started posting news uh, i grabbed the links i'd write a blurb uh, i'd give it a title um and uh post it up and because I think one of the other reasons why we started doing that was because there was starting to be a lot of money in advertising on websites, uh, which it only had been around for a couple of years that you could do that and people didn't totally freak out about it. Uh, but it was still a very sensitive subject because the, the internet wasn't supposed to be commercial. It wasn't supposed to have ads on it. Um, and if you want to read about some of that controversy, you can look up the, the, the whole green card issue. Uh, on the very first internet advertisement or spam. Um, so uh, we didn't, we felt it would be bad if we put ads on loft.com. We were getting a ton of traffic. Um, uh, really a lot, a lot of people were looking at loft.com website and we didn't want to put ads on it because we thought it would dilute our message. And we also didn't want to grow dependent on the ads such that uh, somebody could tell us what we could and could not say on loft.com. And so part of the reason for Hacker News Network or any other website actually was to put some ads on it. Like we'll, we'll get some, we'll generate a little bit of revenue there and we'll be able to pay our rent and we won't have to pay as much out of pocket. Uh, so that was one of the things that uh, H&N was, was designed for was to host ads. Um, so I, I post the news every day and it, after about a few months, uh, maybe a year, it really started to take off. People really started to look at it every day. Uh, I had big dreams for the site. Um, I wanted it to be a, a new slash dot, uh, but uh, we ended up uh, uh, at stake, then formed, and at stake didn't see any value in, in Hacker News Network and H&N, uh, and so they pretty much killed it. 
Uh, and then years later, I re resurrected it, re resurrected it as a video podcast um, when I didn't know anything about video at all. Uh, and we did that for about a year, but that was like so much work. As anybody who's done just a simple podcast can tell you, uh, doing a scripted show uh, 20, 30 minutes every week is a lot of work. And we just couldn't, we just, we aren't salespeople and we were trying to sell ads for the video. Uh, and we just couldn't make uh, make the revenue numbers work. It was paying for itself. Uh, and it, I think it could, we were just too early. Like at the, the time we couldn't host on YouTube because YouTube had a 10 minute limit. Uh, I think if we had waited three years and did it and and, and after YouTube got rid of their limit uh, and it actually started becoming an advertising platform instead of a video platform, maybe it would have taken off. Uh, but we were hosting on a, a, a hosting service called Blip and it just didn't have the reach uh, that YouTube did. Um, and so uh, after about, uh, I think, 16 months or so, uh, we just realized this is not, this is too much work. I can't, I'm burnt out, can't do it anymore. And so we had to, we closed it up. But yeah, so that was Hacker News Network. And again, one of the, one of the uh, goals of HNN was to help education, um, not just the general populace, but also other media and trying to paint the, the good work that hackers do uh, as good as opposed to sensationalist and bad and criminal. Perhaps the most famous event in the history of the loft was its congressional testimony. Imagine seven young hackers appearing before Senator Thompson's Governmental Affairs Committee in 1998. If you uh, gentlemen would come forward. We're joined today by the seven members of the loft a uh, hacker think tank in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, due to the sensitivity of the work done at the loft, they'll be using their hacker names of Mudge, Weld, Brian Oblivion, Kingpin, Space Rogue, Tan, and Stefan. Gentlemen. <laughs> I uh, I hope my grandkids don't ask me who my witnesses were today and <laughs> say Space Rogue. Good morning. I'm Space Rogue. Although my background contains no formal computer training, I've amassed a great deal of knowledge in computer security and the use of technology applications in the area of physical security. Currently, I'm working on assessing the vulnerabilities in various proximity detection devices, such as those used by EasyPass, Mobile Speed Pass, and controlled access cards. In conjunction with Stefan von Neumann, seated here today, and others in the hacking community, I'm acting seeking vulnerabilities in Apple Share IP by Apple Computer. I wish to take this opportunity to thank the members of this committee for inviting us here today. Given that there were other hacker organizations in 1998, such as the CDC, how did the loft get chosen to appear before Congress? I have heard, and I, and I allude to this in the book, I don't really know how it happened, even though I was there. Um, and there are a lot of, there have been a couple of other versions of this story that have floated out um, through Mudge and Weld and whatnot. Uh, and I don't know, maybe their versions are more accurate than my version. But um, the way I understood it at the time was that we got a media press hit in Improper Bostonian, uh, which is a local uh, entertainment magazine in Boston. Um, and we were supposed to get the cover, but the, the Nantucket Nectars guys got the cover. Uh, but anyway, we got like a three page spread inside this magazine, it made a pretty big splash in Boston. Um, and from that, uh, there was an excerpt pulled that was published in the Washington Post because the, the, uh, the reporter, the author, the writer who wrote the improper Bostonian piece, like cut parts of it out, mismatched it together and submitted it to the Post as another story. And, and the Post ran it, um, which was a, a good, a good, nice, good little media hit in the Washington, D.C. area. And a, again, as the story as I know it, is a staffer in Senator Thompson's office read this piece in the Washington Post and was like, hey, we should get these folks here into, into Washington. And so uh, they contacted uh, Mudge uh, and invited us down. Uh, and we were a little hesitant as to whether or not we should actually go or not. Um, because a lot of people don't realize this, we were not actually the first hackers to testify at Congress. Uh, Emmanuel Goldstein had gone a few years before uh, and testified under uh, his other alternate name, uh, Eric Corley, 
Uh, and Susan Thunder actually testified in Congress even years before that. Um, but uh, Emmanuel Goldstein's uh, time was not pleasant. Uh, he was uh, accused by Senator, Mar I think it was Senator Markoff, of being a criminal. Uh, and you're on, you know, you're under oath. Uh, you, you really, there's not a lot you can do if they decide to ambush you there behind the behind the dais uh, in that room. Uh, you can't go anywhere. You're kind of set there, and you got to answer the questions. Um, so we weren't sure how much we could trust them and weren't sure uh, what really to expect once we got there. So we didn't advertise the fact that we were going to go, even though we knew months in advance. Uh, and we just kind of hope, hoping it was going to go well. Uh, and if it didn't go well, then we just wouldn't say anything about it and we just pretend it didn't happen. Uh, but it, it went well. And so uh, afterwards, we there was a ton of media and we... Uh, you know, we were very happy that we weren't, you know, labeled as bad guys, uh, you know, in, on a, in the Senate floor. And and so, yeah, so that story has been told a lot. And I go into great detail in the book as to exactly what happened and what the feelings were. Um, but it, it wasn't. Uh, and, and I think I was very surprised how it turned out 20 years later, 25 years later. Uh, yeah. So it's 25 years. The anniversary is this May. Uh, and exactly how much of an impact this had. I mean, the Washington Post did a, uh, a full page, front page spread uh, on the 20th anniversary um, with that famous photo, uh, uh, which I should, I should mention, I wanted to use the photo on the book. Uh, so there's a, for those that don't, aren't familiar, there's a famous photo of all seven of us sitting at the table with little placards with our handles uh, in front of us. Um, and it's kind of, we've dubbed it internally as the loft supper uh because it has it kind of looks the same it has that same uh, idea and it's a very iconic photo in the community but I, I went to use it to, to on the book and i, I looked it up to, to get the license and it was like 1500 bucks uh to put on the cover uh and even putting it interior was ex expensive and i was like you know i just i can't justify that kind of spend on the book so uh we that's why i ended up with the line drawing and i actually like the line drawing better uh, on the cover I think it looks a, gives it a much more impact um, overall. You need to read the book for more context on this, but how they got to Washington was pretty unusual. Basically, they decided to drive a Dodge van from Boston to Washington, D.C., and once there, they were very serious about maintaining their hacker handles, such that when they tried to check into the hotel in Washington, they were kind of rebuffed at first. Fortunately, Senator Thompson's team helped out with that, because... Really, you can't check into a hotel as Space Rogue or Kingpin or Mudge. Nobody had ID that said those things. Do you know who I am? So, the, yeah, the, the handle thing was, was important. We had uh, very, very judiciously protected our uh, given names and identities uh, and only published things on the handle, uh, basically as a, as a legal protection uh, to prevent lawsuits. Uh, you can't really take Mudge to court, right? Uh, it's hard to take Space Rogue to court. Um, it didn't, as I allude to in the book, we, that actually happened uh, uh, once or twice where we did have some legal issues that we had to resolve. But uh, we still wanted, didn't want it in the, in, in, the, in the mainstream press also to protect our jobs. Uh, a lot of cases, we didn't, weren't really sure how our employers would feel uh, employing a hacker which they may in instantly uh, equate to being a criminal or, or bad person or whatever. Uh, and, and so there was a lot of that uh, feeling going around and we really wanted to protect our jobs so that we could pay our rent. Uh, so one of the stipulations of us testifying uh, was that we would be able to do so uh, under our handle. And my understanding was uh, that we were the first people to ever uh, testify to that extent under a pseudonym. Um, evidently, there were other people using pseudonyms in the past, but uh, not to the extent that we were where we would get reimbursed for our travel expenses in cash from the uh, U.S. government uh, office that we had to go down into the basement of the Capitol to see. Uh, and the guy behind the counter was like, yeah, he's done this before. He's just like, OK. And he had made up other names for us, uh, uh, somehow baseball related. I don't remember what they were. I think Kim Kim remembers. But uh, so, yeah, so we we're in the room. Uh, in the uh, in the Senate chamber uh, testifying room, and we they had these little plaques with our names on them, our our handles. So there's a space rogue. Somebody had engraved into plastic and put in front of my seat. Um, it's just very uh, 
uh, a little bit surreal. Um, but, uh, you know, we felt it was important so that we could uh, maintain that, uh, uh, maintain our day jobs, if you will. Chris continued to protect his privacy for a long, long time. And I'm curious, in the book, why he continued to refer to people that are known by their given names by their handles. Was it familiarity or something else? I mean, why call him Kingpin when we know him as Joe Grand? For the most part, I mean, he'll always be Kingpin to me. It's KP. Like, that's his name. Like, I, who's Joe? I don't know who Joe Grand is. I never heard of him. But Kingpin, I know, right? Mudge, I know. Weld, I know. Uh, Chris Weisopel, he's some big CEO in Boston of some company that has software security. I don't know who that is. Weld, Weld's a hacker. I know Weld. Um, and as it's familiar for me, it's familiarity. I, the, those are identities that were built up over time. Um, and I, I think for me personally, um, I left at, uh, there was a time after I left at stake where the CEO basically forced everybody to drop their handles uh, and use their, their given name. Um, but I had left before then. So I was one of the last of the loft people to still use their handle exclusively. And so when I started working in the security industry uh, with um, Trustwave, I obviously had to tell Trustwave what my, my given name was so that they could cut me a check because I didn't have a checking account at Space Rogue. Um, but uh, they, they, I still published things under the handle. I still, people referred to me in the workspace, people I didn't know, I was still Space Rogue to them. Um, uh, same thing at Tenable. Uh, and now I'm at IBM and I still have, I have space rogue at IBM.com as an email address. Uh, I'm in the Slack channel as space rogue. Like that is my identity. And so I actually struggled with the, when I wrote the book, I was like, do I want to put the given name on the book as well? Or just the handle, uh, you know, space rogue by space rogue. Uh, so, you know, I opted to put the, the given name on the book. Uh, notice the font size of the of the of my given name is much smaller than the font size of the title of the space rogue. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm in some circles, I am space rogue, and that's what people know me as. And I feel weird when I go to a hacker conference and people say, "Hey, Chris, what's up?" I'm like, "Who? Like, that's not me. Uh, I have a handle. Uh, that's the name you know me as. That's the name I've always used in this conference. Please continue to use it." Um, you know, my wife has actually started to refer to herself as Mrs. Rogue. Uh, that's kind of how far how far and deep it goes. My my 11 year old has a handle because um, he thought it was really cool uh, to have a handle, so he created himself a handle. He calls himself Coda, um, which I'm hoping eh, it's a good handle. Um, anyway, so yeah, the and it, the thing is, like, there are people in the industry today who have a handle that they use as a real name. And they can get away with it because their handle sort of sounds legit. You know, their handle is John Smith. So, hey, John, how you doing? But that's not their actual given name. That's a handle. I know of at least three people who are very well known in the industry uh, whose name uh, does not match the name uh, on their birth certificate. Um, and I, I don't know if maybe they've legally changed it, but uh, it, it was originally a handle. They just picked one that sounded real. Um, and, you know, it would have been nice if I had chosen uh, Brian Oblivion because I could have gone with Brian Oblivion. Nobody would question it. Right. Stefan von Neumann. Nobody would question that as a handle as opposed to a, a legit name. So you don't always know, uh, I guess. But Space Rogue, you know, nobody's going to name their kids Space Mr. Rogue. Uh, but that's the handle I have. It's the one I chose. I'm still using it 30 years later. And, and, and depending on the environment and the venue is the, the, the one I prefer. Given his experience, I wonder if Chris has seen any new hacker communities, aside from hacker spaces, that remind him of his experience in the 1990s with Loft. You know, that's a question that gets asked, um, and it's hard to say. Uh, I think the Loft uh, ended up being a uh, the right place, right time type scenario, uh, and the fact that it was physical and not just virtual. Um, there are a lot of hacker spaces around today. Uh, but they're, they're not, I don't know if their goals are the same or the, they have, a, in some cases, they seem to have a lot more structure and in other cases, they seem to have a lot less structure. Uh, some are 503C corporations. Um, some have very strict membership rules, a, a lot, you know, they have physical spaces that people meet up. Um, and then there are, there are virtual groups too, uh, where, you know, you have groups created around. Uh, various software packages that are free and open source software packages. Uh, and their goal is to create that one package and, and work on that. 
Um, so, and I don't know if Loft ever had, had that one specific goal. I definitely didn't have it starting out. And our goal sort of morphed, morphed over time and uh, evolved uh, and, and grew into security. Um, just because we were, we were doing the work at, at our day jobs and we're like, you know, this is wrong. Uh, we need to get this fixed so that the users that I support can have uh, a more secure environment and I don't have to worry about my job coming down around me because there's this big hole in this piece of software. So, you know, um, so yeah, can it happen? Can loft happen again today? Maybe. Uh, I think maybe there are more challenges today. Um, uh, and, and so the likelihood of, of a similar group uh, emerging, I, I think, are slim. It's possible, but you, know, you never know. I'd like to thank Chris Thomas for talking about his own personal journey through InfoSec and also the founding of The Loft. His book is called Space Rogue, How the Hackers Known as The Loft Changed the World. Chris has written perhaps the best book about the early days of hacking. Unlike a journalist chronicling events from the outside, Chris was on the inside. This is not only the story of the loft, it's also the story of his life. So there's the often missing context provided, with countless asides and anecdotes woven in instead of tacked on. I thoroughly enjoyed reading this book, cover to cover. The book is available online from Amazon and Barnes & Noble and your local favorite bookstore, or wherever you find good books. Hey, I'm just getting started with error code. DM me at robertvamosi at infosec.exchange on Mastodon or at robertvamosi on Twitter. And tell me what you like and even what you don't. I've got some great episodes coming up, so subscribe today on your favorite podcast platform. I don't want you to miss out. <laughs>